So indeed, in our laboratory, we have two major subjects of research. We have our fundamental research on the mechanisms involved in nutrient sensing in yeast. And then, in addition, we have to do also uh, valorization of the science. And for that, we have developed the technologies for the analysis of complex traits. And we are using these technologies to improve uh, industrial yeast strains to construct superior industrial yeast strains. So how do people, how, how did people in the past select yeast strains? How, where do yeast strains come from? Wine strains, beer strains, whatever. And most of these strains have actually been just selected and then bred further. But when you select yeast strains, I mean, you will never find the perfect yeast strain. So you're always limited to what is available. You can also breed yeast strains. You can cross them. You can hybridize them. And then uh, you can try to find a, a strain with a better property or better combination of properties. But you will also al always lose properties, when good properties, when you breed strains. And especially for a microorganism, an industrial microorganism, this, this poses an additional challenge. Because you can only check the microorganism or different strains in laboratory scale, while in industrial and big scale, you can only check one or two microorganisms at most. So you can always have properties that, that are lost, important properties at, high, at, at big scale, at industrial scale. You can also mutagenize yeast strains. You can select uh, uh, yeast strains with a, with a superior uh, trait. Uh, but mutagenesis only works for selectable phenotypes. You have to be able to select the mutant. When you do mutagenesis, you very often get background mutations in the cells that are negative, that have negative effects or have side effects, and especially negative effects that you only see at industrial scale, so when it's too late. You can do evolution engineering, yeah, over-select for a single trait, but this has uh, taught us that you very easily lose other important uh, properties. Since the times of the molecular biology, we can also do genetic modification. What have we learned there? Many things. Uh, deletion or overexpression of genes in industrial yeast strains often gives two drastic effects that are not wanted in industrial usage. Many unexpected side effects especially because we use industrial strains, and industrial strains turn out to be quite different from the nice laboratory strains that we are used to work with in the fundamental research. In spite of that, the yeast biodiversity is very, very large. It's enormous. In our lab, we have about 800 Saccharomyces cerevisiae strains. When you screen them for different properties, you get a very large variety of, of uh, differences between the strains. Actually, in Italy, there is a very uh, good uh, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae collection with a few thousands of, of strains, actually. And the genetic basis of this uh, variation in these properties is unknown. And if we would know it, we could use it to construct, to develop um, in improved strains. What is the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is that uh, most of the industrially important traits are polygenic traits, are complex traits, are traits that are determined by multiple genes, not just by one gene. And until recently, there were no efficient methodologies to identify all the genes, all the mutant genes, all the alleles that were involved in establishing a polygenic trait, a complex trait. And this is what we have developed. We have developed a new technology, a new approach to identify the genetic basis of complex traits, and especially the industrially important complex traits that we can use to improve uh, industrial strains. The idea here is to identify superior alleles that give you superior ethanol tolerance, superior thermotolerance, superior acetic acid tolerance, and then to transfer only these superior alleles into industrial yeast strains. So that we get a more gradual, subtle improvement of the properties, no over drastic effects that we minimize the risk of having side effects on other traits, and also that we get predictable improvement of our industrial yeast strains. So this is actually the scheme that we are using. We are screening collections of yeast strains for strains with superior properties. We are identifying the genes involved in these superior properties, and we are transferring these genes 
one by one into existing industrial strains that are usually not protected. But the use of these superior alleles, we can protect them with pattern applications. And in this way, we can obtain superior industrial strains which are protected, patented, and also are very well traceable. So what is the issue with polygenic traits? Actually, most properties of organisms are polygenic properties, are determined by multiple genes. In our genetics courses, we have learned the, 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 the laws of genetics, the Mendelian laws, but all these laws have been made with simple properties, simple monogenic properties. Most properties are complex, are defined by multiple genes. And these multiple genetic elements, they also have a complex relationship between, with each other. They can work just additively, but they can also work synergistically interdependent of each other. And therefore, it is not possible to map the genes involved in a complex trait individually. You have to map them together because they interact together and often also because the individual contributions of the mutant genes are too small to, to analyze them. So we have to map them and identify them together. And <clears throat> to do simultaneous mapping of different genes located in the whole genome, therefore we need genome-wide markers. We need markers throughout the genome that we can follow in crosses. And in the past, there were no methodologies available to get such markers. Now, after the development of the microarrays, and now with the whole genome sequence analysis, we can use SNPs, we can use single nucleotide polymorphisms, small mutations, basically, as genetic markers covering the whole genome. And when we use two unrelated yeast strains, we have 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 60,000 SNPs between two strains so that we easily cover the whole genome. Based on this new high throughput sequencing technologies that we use, to f not, not so much for the sequence, but we use them to follow the SNPs as markers, we have developed the technology of pooled segregant whole genome sequence analysis. So in this technology, we use a superior yeast strain, a haploid strain, because we have to cross the strain. The strain can be derived from a superior diploid that we have identified by screening a collection. And we cross the strain with an inferior haploid strain. In the beginning, we used a laboratory strain as inferior strain because the laboratory strains are quite weak for many properties. But we have stopped with that because when you cross with a laboratory strain, you often find uh, wild type genes that are defective in the laboratory strain. So you, you map defects of the laboratory strain, which is not so interesting. Nowadays, we cross with industrial strains to have really superior genes from the superior parent strain. So okay, so we cross the two strains, the superior strain with the inferior strain, the control strain. We obtain the hybrid diploid strain. We sporulate the strain. We phenotype the segregants for our property of interest. And we always get a very big range in the, in, in the property that we want to, to investigate, that we study. Then from these uh, thousands uh, of uh, segregants that we have phenotyped, we select the best ones. And we need about 30 segregants with the superior property similar, or sometimes even better, than the parent strain. <coughs> so we select the best segregants. We pool these segregants. We extract the genomic DNA and we submit the genomic DNA of the pool to whole genome sequence analysis, usually done by Illumina sequencing, just as if it would come from one organism. We also sequence the parent strains in order to, get to, to identify all the SNPs. And then this information, as you will see, we will use it to map the genes that are responsible for the superior trait in the superior segregants. The Illumina sequencing, as you know, makes uh, many short reads. Uh, you see 100, 200 base pairs only. At the top, we have the sequence of the reference genome. Here you see the sequences of all the uh, segregants, the pooled segregants. And as you can see, the sequence is the same uh, in, in most places, except here, here we have a SNP. You see, there is a T or a C. And we have in the pool, we have 36 segregants. 26 have the T, which is the nucleotide of the superior parent. 10 have the C, which is the nucleotide of the inferior parent. So for this SNP, 
we have, in this case, a variant frequency of 72% for the nucleotide of the superior part. Now, this information, the variant frequency of every SNP, and then we speak about 10,000 to 50,000 SNPs, this information we obtain from the sequencing center. Usually we do in, in China, in BGI, to have the, se the sequencing done. This information we get from the, from the sequencing center, and then we plot the SNP variant frequency over the position of the SNP in the chromosome. In this case, for instance, chromosome 14. All the little dots that you see here, the gray dots, are SNPs. And they all have a variant frequency, for instance, T or C. If it is 1, it would be 100% T. If it's 0, it would be 100% C. In most of the genome, the SNP variant frequency for the SNPs hovers around 50% say between 40 and 60 percent. And then in selected places, you can see this variant frequency changes, increases, 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 goes to the top, and then goes back down. That means that in this area in the chromosome, there is something that is important for the superior property of the segregants. Because you selected the segregants with the superior property, you have selected the little pieces of the genome that are important for this property. So this piece, by preference, comes from the superior parent because the SNPs come from the superior parent. You see, we use the SNPs as markers. So we can say there in the genome there is something, a gene, one of the SNPs, an insertion, a duplication, a foreign gene, whatever. There is something that is important for this superior property. So I will give an example now. The first, the first uh, uh, time that we uh, developed this technology and used this technology was to identify the genetic basis of high ethanol tolls, which of course is a very important property of yeast uh, uh, for industrial usage. It's a polygenic property, for sure, determined by multiple genes. And uh, for this uh, analysis, we used the Brazilian strain, the uh, former Brazilian production strain, VR1 which has a high ethyl tolerance, is actually a wild yeast contaminant. The Brazilian production strains are yeast strains that come with a sugar cane into the fermentations and have been selected because of their good properties. And we have used uh, this strain as a superior strain. It has very good ethanol tolerance. You can see 14%, 16%, uh, even grows a bit at 18% ethanol. It's much higher than the laboratory strains that have had up to then been analyzed for ethanol tolerance. The BY laboratory strain is the same background as S288C. It has a poor ethanol tolerance. You can see here uh, it barely grows at 14, 16% already. Then we, uh, we uh, sporulated the Brazilian strain, and we isolated a haploid that was equally uh, ethanol tolerant and actually even a little bit better than the uh, superior parent. Sometimes we get uh, haploid segregants from a superior strain that are better than the parent. The hybrid strain, the diploid made by, with the BY strain and the haploid Brazilian strain, also has high ethanol tolerance, uh, indicating that high ethanol tolerance is a dominant property. So now, now we want to know what genes uh, make the difference in ethanol tolerance between the two strains. So we have uh, sporulated the hybrid strain, uh, and we phenotyped all the segregants for uh, ethanol tolerance. You can see some have poor ethanol tolerance. These are the two parents again, the Brazilian parent and the laboratory strain uh, with a big difference in, in ethanol tolerance. And you can see some segregants have poor ethanol tolerance, then some segregants have very good ethanol tolerance. And we phenotyped 5,974 segregants in this way for ethanol tolerance. 136 segregants had high ethanol tolerance, able to grow well on 16% ethanol. And as you will see further on, of the 136, 31 were able to grow on 17% ethanol. And we actually made two pools. Now from this ratio, 136 in 5,974, you can deduce how many independent loci must be involved in establishing this trait. The trait, the difference between the two strains always. And this must be, you can do this with this formula, and it must be around five to six independent loci must be involved in establishing the trait, if the loci are independent, but they are not always independent, of course. So, 
We actually, as I said, we made two pools. We had the first pool with 136 segregants able to grow on 16% ethanol. And, and from these 136, 31 were able to grow on 17% ethanol. And we made a second pool with the 17% ethanol strains. So we, we pool the strains, we extract the, the DNA, we send for sequencing, and we do the QTL mapping, and the result is what you see here for the 16 chromosomes. We have two lines. The green line is for the 16% ethanol. The 17% ethanol is the red line. And in general, the, the two lines are quite similar. You can see that for a number of chromosomes like this one here, 16, this one, you see the, the SNP variant frequency just hovers around 50%, between 40%, 60%. So there is nothing in these chromosomes that is important for um, uh, high ethanol tolerance. But then in certain places, you can see clear deviations from the 50% line. Here, another one. Here is the strongest deviation, goes up to nearly 90%. That means that most of the segregants actually have the nucleotide of the superior parent. So there are also some other places, like uh, in, in this chromosome and in this chromosome. You can see it here enlarged. So we see that there is a clear deviation for the 17% ethanol pool, but not really for the 16% ethanol pool. Here the same, you see only a small bump for the 16% ethanol pool, but a clear increase for the 17% ethanol pool. This indicates that there is a mutant gene in this position and in this position that is not yet important to be tolerant to 16% ethanol, but becomes important to be tolerant to 17% ethanol, which uh, indicates that the more stringent phenotyping reveals the minor loci involved in, in, in the very good property. But of course, it also means that you have to phenotype more segregants eh, to get to the 30 segregants. When we have this result from the pooled segregant sequencing, then we will select specific SNPs, you see, from the, the many SNPs available, and we will score these SNPs by allele-specific PCR in the individual segregants. So in the 136 or the 31 segregants, we score all the SNPs and we, we in, in the same area. And what you see, uh, in this case, we can, of course, determine the, the frequency exactly. Huh? So many segregants have an A, so ma many segregants have a T. And you see that when we determine the, the SNP variant frequency in this way, we get a very similar peak as, as with the pool segregant sequence, confirming that really this methodology works eh, and works well. With these uh, individual um, frequencies, we can calculate p-values, eh, statistical values, and we use a p-value cutoff of 0 0.05, a 95% cutoff, and we can calculate the p-values for all the different SNPs. And you can see that the p-value drops here for the QTL3, which had the strongest link, the, uh, the p-value drops to a very low value, indicating that this is really a significant deviation from the 50% value. When we have this uh, valley, we take some additional SNPs, uh, you see here, and we do fine mapping with uh, individual SNPs to get to, to the, the shortest uh, fragment in the genome that has a statistically significant link. And in this case, you see, we could reduce it to about 12 KB. Then, of course, we, 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 the 12 KB, we go to the SGD, and we look what genes are located in this 12 KB fragment. And in this case, there was nothing, no gene that had ever been connected with high ethanol tolerance. And uh, when we have the genes that are present in this uh, position, then we, we check what genes have mutations, because those without mutations uh, are, are not relevant. And we used here the laboratory strain as a control strain, so we can just use the sequence of the laboratory strain as the control sequence. Now, I told you that between two unrelated yeast strains, there are about 10,000 to 50,000 SNPs, which is good for the mapping. But it also means, of course, that when we look for the, what genes have SNPs, that basically all genes have uh, SNPs, either in the open reading frame or in the promoter or the terminator. Sometimes a mutation in the terminator, we have found, is, is uh, the, the causative mutation. So in practice, we have to check all these genes individually, whether they are uh, important for the phenotype or not. 
And we, of course, we look at the non-synonymous mutations, but as I said, uh, most genes have either mutations in the open reading frame, the terminator, the promoter, or actually in, in, in all three even sometimes. Now, to find out which one of this mutant gene, of these mutant genes, is now the important one, or maybe there are multiple that are important in the locus, we use a uh, methodology that is called reciprocal hemizygosity analysis. And in this approach, two diploid strains are constructed from the two parents. You see, the VR15B, the Brazilian parent, is crossed with a laboratory strain here to make a new hybrid. Here again, it's the same. Two, the two strains are, are crossed. But in this diploid, we delete one copy of the candidate gene that we are testing. And we leave the allele from the superior parent intact. The other diploid strain, we delete the copy of the inferior gene. Uh, sorry, we, we delete the copy of the superior gene, and we have the copy of the inferior BY parent left. <coughs> this can be done in different ways. You can do that in the diploid, but you can also cross the strains, of course, make them first. So now we have two diploid strains <coughs> that only differ in a single copy of the candidate gene. And the single copy is important for the recessive mutations. Otherwise, you have no effect of the recessive mutation. And as you can see also, this strain has all the mutations from the superior parent that are important for high ethanol tolerance. All the other mutations. So when the mutations have to work together, this mutant allele has all the other mutations in the genome. So it can work together. That's why this, this methodology has been uh, developed. And we have done that for all the genes in the, in the locus. I have only shown four here. And you can see for this gene, there is no difference in ethanol tolerance. <coughs> for this gene, there's also no difference in ethanol tolerance. The next one is the same also. But then you see for the APJ1 gene, APJ1 gene, the allele of the superior parent, the Brazilian parent, clearly gives better growth on ethanol than the allele of the inferior laboratory strain. So indicating that APJ1 has a mutation that helps to establish high ethanol tolerance. And we have confirmed that in, in different other ways. Actually, the, the biochemical activity of APJ1, it's a, it's a putative co-chaperon. But what was very remarkable is that this allele has a lower expression than the allele of the inferior strain. So it's a negative element for ethanol tolerance. And when the expression is lower, then you have higher ethanol tolerance. So we have also uh, identified um, mutant alleles in other loci. Actually, this QTL3 had two uh, causative genes, APJ1, as I said, and also MKT1. But MKT1 seems to have a mutation in the laboratory strain that gives a, gives a defective protein and is important for many properties, actually affects many properties. In this uh, QTL, we identified VPS70. It's a vacuole protein sorting uh, mutant, uh, VPS70. And it's a protein involved in the secretion pathway. And then in this QTL, we identified the URA3 because the laboratory strain is a URA3 mutant. And we have traced this back that high ethanol levels inhibit the uptake of small molecules into the cells. So the uracil that has to be taken up in a ura 3 mutant, its uptake is inhibited by the high ethanol. And that's why the wild type gene gives you an advantage for high ethanol tolerance, which of course is not so very interesting for us. It's one of Randy Sheckman's genes that just got the Nobel Prize for that. <laughs> so we have uh, done this type of analysis with a pooled segregant uh, whole genome sequencing for several properties already, also for other properties. The first one was ethanol tolerance of cell pro uh, proliferation. And here we have done uh, uh, maximal ethanol accumulation capacity, which is a difficult property because you have to do fermentations and determine the maximal level of ethanol that can be accumulated by the strain or the segregant with every individual strain. So with uh, more than 1,000 segregants, we did individual fermentations, and it, we determined whether they can accumulate a high ethanol level. And uh, here we have uh, 
uh, done, had, we have the sequencing done by GATC Biotech, a company in, in Constance in Switzerland, and also by BGI, and we compared the results, and actually you can nearly superimpose them. Okay? So it shows that uh, the technology is very robust, even if the sequencing is done by, by different uh, companies. Here we have also used a random pool of segregants. And when, when you just take a random pool of segregants and you sequence, you can see that the, the s and variant frequency is everywhere on the 50% the line, practically. There is a, a, a funny deviation here. We know what the, the reason is for that. It's not so important. And sometimes you can have a, a small deviations also in the random pool of uh, segregants because you inadvertently select for good mating capacity, for good spore relation, for good spore viability. Then when we, <coughs> when we uh, um, determined the loci for maximal ethyl accumulation capacity, with the same segregants, we also did ethyl tolerance of cell proliferation, so just on plates, like in the first example. And you can see that the, there is a correlation between the two properties, eh, like here, for instance, like here. But there are also uh, loci which are different. Uh, like here, the, the most important one was uh, a locus with AD1 and KIN3. KIN3 is a, a protein kinase involved in um, a repair of uh, mutations and DNA repair, indicating that uh, um, high, ethanol high ethanol levels uh, could be mutagenic to the yeast, and that a protein kinase that helps to repair these mutations is beneficial to survive in, in high ethanol levels. <coughs> Another property that we have uh, uh, analyzed is low glycerol production, high ethanol production. is an important uh, property in industrial bioethanol production. And uh, this is the result with uh, uh, first uh, segregants, uh, the first generation segregants. And you can see here a very strong uh, QTL, which actually practically goes up to 1, uh, to 100%. And uh, this was because 43 of the 44 superior segregants that we analyzed, all had the mutant allele. So it was a very important allele to have low glycerol production. It was a very strange uh, mutation. It was an insertion of a nucleotide that caused a change in the reading frame and a little bit further a stop codon. So it was a partially mistranslated truncated protein. And funny enough, this mutation was present in two copies in the original parent strain, which was a sake strain. And so uh, we then reasoned, OK, this uh, 44 uh, segregant, number 44, must have uh, all the other mutations that cause low glycerol production if it does not have this very important one. It has to have all the other ones, because this one was also uh, superior. It also had the low glycerol production. So we, we backcrossed this number 44 with the inferior parent. And we did the, the pool segregant sequencing with this uh, backcross. Now you also know when you cross a child with this parent, uh, half of the genome of the child is the same as from the parent. Okay. So here, that you can see very nicely, for instance, in, in, in this chromosome, we have uh, SNPs. We have no SNPs. We have again SNPs. Here, this chromosome 3, we have no SNPs, SNPs. SNPs, no SNPs. SNPs, no SNPs. SNPs, no SNPs. SNPs. Because we have parts of the chromosome that are derived from the superior parent, parts of the chromosome are derived from the inferior parent, and when we backcross, we only see SNPs, we only see differences when we have a difference in the genome. When we have, again, superior crossed with inferior. So we used this uh, result to identify new genes involved in the low glycerol production. And we found here, you see, SMP1, uh, GPD1, which is the glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, uh, responsible for the production of glycerol, and HOT1 uh, as causative uh, alleles. The random pool is the green line. You can see it's lower than the selected pool is the red line. Here also, we have the green line, the red line, the green line, the red line. Everywhere we ha where we have a difference, we have uh, something that is important for the phenotype. These uh, uh, three genes, uh, SSK1, uh, SMP1, and HOT1, are known genes involved in the regulation of glycerol production. GPD1, of course, is an enzyme involved in glycerol production. So this really confirmed that with this uh, approach, you can identify uh, genes involved in regulation, uh, in, in regulatory properties, and in regulatory pathways. 
thermotolerance. We have uh, used the original parents is the, is the green line. And then we identified in the superior parent a gene, a, a superior gene, but also in the inferior parent. We found a superior gene. And so we used that to downgrade the two parents, and we crossed again. And then in the, in the new cross, we identified two more genes. So we have four genes that we identified for high thermo thermotolerance. You see this MKT1 is popping up again because we crossed with the lab strain. And the NCS2 and PRP42 were completely new genes that had never been connected to high thermotolerance. So we actually patented uh, the use of these genes to improve thermotolerance. We have uh, applied this uh, technology to uh, several other traits, acetic acetolins. We also have the first genes identified. Xylose fermentation capacity, we have the first gene identified. Protein secretion capacity, we are busy with that. Heavy metal tolerance, flavor production, uh, this is ongoing. So we can conclude that this technology, pool segregant, uh, whole genome sequence analysis, is actually also now done with other organisms, with plants, with, uh, with animals. You can also do that. You can do that with any organism that you can cross that has sexual reproduction. We can clearly use the SNPs as, as markers, as genetic markers in the whole genome. We can cross two unrelated strains. Now we always use the target industrial strain that we want to improve as the control strain, because we don't want, want to identify defective genes anymore. We can clearly identify all major loci and the causative genes. We can also find uh, additional minor loci, the more stringent phenotyping improves the detection of the minor loci. We have also done inbreeding of the F1 segregants, which makes the loci more narrow and simplifies the identification of the causative gene. And we have also already transferred mutant alleles in uh, industrial strains and indeed uh, have obtained uh, improved properties. So we can now use this methodology to identify the genetic basis of, in principle, any complex traits, trait of Saccharomyces cerevisiae and other species that you can cross. We have superior alleles identified for multiple traits, and we are transferring these alleles now in, in industrial strains to improve their properties. So in the second part of my talk, I will tell you something about our yeast strains for second generation bioethanol production. Probably you have heard about that, that people want to replace the first generation bioethanol production with wheat and corn, and want to replace that with, uh, with uh, waste materials that are often uh, thrown away. Actually, sometimes people have to pay to get rid of these materials, linocellulose uh, materials. And uh, the problem with Saccharomyces cerevisiae is that it cannot utilize uh, C5 sugar, sugars, pantose sugars, mainly xylose and arabinose, but especially xylose has a quite a high level, uh, between 30 and 40 percent of the sugar in the linocellulose biomass is uh, xylose. And a second problem is that uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and actually most microorganisms, cannot tolerate the high levels of inhibitors that are generated in these hydrolysis. Other problems, uh, other issues is that we also require a robust industrial yeast strain because the strain has to be produced, has to be grown on molasses, has to be dried, has to be stored. So we, we need a good industrial yeast strain as a starting strain for uh, a second generation bioethanol production strain. And that has not been available uh, up to now. Other microorganisms are not good for that because the industrial yeast strains have a proven history of use in, in industry. This is a lignocellulose hydrolysate of, of uh, spruce. You see, it looks terrible. Uh, if, if you would be a yeast and you have to ferment this uh, or you have to choose between this and grape juice, uh, you would also prefer to ferment grape juice, I, I think. Uh, it's a very uh, dense, it's very sticky material. It's difficult to prepare, to prepare with high enough uh, sugar content. And it has lots of inhibitors uh, in, in this material, inhibitors derived from the linocellulose material or, or uh, generated by the hydrolysis and the pretreatment procedures. So in uh, the European uh, NEMO project, uh, which was uh, aimed at the uh, generation of new enzymes and new microorganisms for second generation bioethanol production, we decided that to, to make a good industrial yeast strain for second generation bioethanol production, we have to start from an industrial strain, from a proven industrial strain. And that's what we did. 
the ethanol red strain from uh, Fermentis Le Safre is one of the most uh, used uh, uh, bioethanol production strains in the, second, in the first generation uh, with the corn and, and wheat uh, uh, bioethanol production. And so we, we decided to use that strain uh, to introduce pentose fermentation ability. And so the group of Eckert Bolus introduced the uh, cassette with xylose uh, isomerase, uh, arabinose uh, uh, metabolism genes, overexpression of some pantose phosphate pathway genes, and introduced that into this ethanol red strain. When you do this in a laboratory strain, it nicely ferments the, the xylose and the arabinose, but of course, a laboratory strain is not, uh, not with very high efficiency. This strain did not do anything with the xylose or the arabinose, in spite of the fact that the enzymes, the enzyme activities, were present in extracts of the cells. This uh, cassette was introduced in uh, chromosome uh, 15. And then we got a little bit nervous in the project because we could not get uh, strains that worked, and they also tried to get strains that uh, fermented xylose and all the strains were unstable. And then we used a, 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 a multiple approach multiple strategy in which we first mutagenized this strain very, very heavily. There were practically no survivors anymore. We selected on xylose mutants that could grow on xylose. And we had some that grew a little bit on xylose. Then we, we crossed them. We did genome shuffling to lose bad mutations because we mutagenized so heavily. We mated the strains with genome shuffling to, to uh, good, to, to, um, obtain good sporulators, good maters, and each time we selected on xylose medium. We also selected then the, the strains for inhibitor tolerance in spruce hydrolysate. Spruce hydrolysate has the highest level of inhibitors uh, of, of the hydrolysate, so linocellulose. We added xylose, and then we selected again in YP xylose to have a strain that could actually uh, grow and ferment xylose. And this strain, first generation, fermented and the xylose and grew a little bit on the xylose. Then, we transferred this strain every few weeks from one batch culture to the next batch culture. Each time that it started to grow a bit, we transferred it to the next culture. And we did several generations like that, and we obtained strains with strongly improved fermentation capacity, as you can see here. This is the original parent strain that basically does very little. These are the mutants. You see, this is a mutant that grew on xylose, but the fermentation is very poor. This mutant, M315, grew a little bit on the xylose, and you see there's some CO2 release from xylose, so it grows and ferments a little bit. Then the next generation was improved, next generation somewhat better, third generation improved, further improved, further improved, further improved. See, we have here strains that have very fast release of carbon dioxide from the, the xylose. And then this is a mixture, of course. It's a whole culture, a mixture. And then we uh, selected uh, uh, individual colonies from the different generations. And as you can see here, from generation two, generation four, generation seven, generation 11, we selected individual colonies and we fermented with these individual strains in separate fermentations. And you can see in the second generation, there's still quite a number of bad strains. This is the original parent strain here. Here we have less bad strains, we improve. The number of bad strains is reduced further. We have quite a number of good strains now, good colonies. And here in 11, you see nearly all the strains that we isolate, all the colonies that we isolate, show good fermentation in separate fermentations. Only one is not so good. And so from this, we selected the GS1-1126 strain as the best strain, and we did more uh, fermentations with that strain. We used a mixture of glucose and xylose. You see the evolved strain. It uses the glucose first and starts already to use the xylose a little bit, and then uses the xylose and uses very well. You see, uses practically all the xylose. This is the ethanol production. It grows a bit, uh, biomass formation. I think the green line is the glycerol. It's not so high. The strain does not make any xylitol which is a problem with the redox pathway. Here we don't have any problem with xylitol formation. And you see the original ethanol red strain with the cassette, it also does very well with glucose, but the xylose is, is not consumed. Then we used the strain in real lignocellulose hydrolysis. This is a synthetic uh, 
mixture of yeast extract pepton with a mixture of glucose and xylose. We use the strain in real hydrolysis. This is wheat, wheat straw and hay mixture. Uh, you can see all the data here, the amount of yeast that we have used. And you can see here the glucose uh, and xylose fermentation in the synthetic medium, what you saw before. In the hydrolysis, it is quite similar. The xylose fermentation is a bit slower. But still, for the two sugars together, we have 94% of the maximum theoretical yield. If that could be obtained in a, in, in a factory, the people would actually be very glad with this type of yield. Then we have a giant reed, uh, hydrolysate is, is coming from a Chemtex. In, in uh, Crescentino, they have built a plant to make second generation bioethyl production with this uh, giant reed, and that will be cultivated there on thousands of hectares. And here also in this hydrolysate, you can see the glucose is used very well. Also, the xylose is used quite well. And we have a 92% yield of the, for the two sugars together. Spruce hydrolysate is more difficult material, has more inhibitors. The glucose fermentation goes very well. The xylose fermentation is a little bit uh, uh, reduced, and we don't use all the xylose, so that we have a total yield only of 88%, which would actually be very, very good, still very good for a commercial plant. But we are trying, of course, to improve the, the strains further. We also did in the project, uh, it was done by Gunnar Liden in Lund, uh, simultaneous saccharification and fermentation, where you do the enzymatic hydrolysis and the fermentation together. And uh, you can see here uh, the, the, well, the glucose is used very, very fast, uh, because the the, as soon as the glucose is produced, the yeast uses it. The, the xylose is uh, accumulated, but then is also used very well, but at least by the uh, evolved strain and the open symbols. The original strain uh, cannot use the xylose. That's why the xylose accumulates, you see. And then the ethanol production by the evolved strain and by the original strain clearly is 20 30% better with the evolved strain, indicating that the xylose fermentation really gives a very strong improvement for the, the ethanol production. So we have also learned already a lot about the reason why the strain is so good. And one thing that has happened in the strain is that it has amplified the xylose isomerase gene. And in addition, the strain has mutations that support the high fermentation efficiency. <coughs> You can see this here very well here. We have this uh, M315 mutant. When we, when we introduce the uh, uh, plasmid with overexpression of xylosazomerase in this mutant, we get strong improvement of the fermentation capacity of xylose. When we introduce a plasmid with high xylose uh, isomerase expression in the original parent strain, there is no improvement at all, indicating that you need some of these specific mutations to improve the xylose fermentation. In the final strain, overexpression of the xylose azomerase does not help anymore because we know that the final strain has amplified its xylose azomerase gene at least 10 times in, in the genome. So <clears throat> the strain was stable. We have grown the strain for more than 50 generations on glucose medium. When we put it back in xylose, it ferments the xylose immediately. We have learned already a lot about the genetic basis, as I, as I told you. But we also noticed that this strain, because of the mutagenesis, because of the evolution engineering, as I told you in the beginning, the strain had negative properties. It had, had a partial aerobic growth defect. The maximal ethyl accumulation was reduced. Acetic acid tolerance was reduced. So we have backcrossed the strain with ethanol red and with another very inhibitor tolerant industrial strain. And we selected for good aerobic growth, high xylose fermentation, high inhibitor tolerance. And this gave us three very good industrial strains that are now being evaluated. These strains have high xylose fermentation capacity, high inhibitor tolerance, work very well in the linocellulose hydrolysis, and they are being evaluated in Brazil, in India, in Australia, in Malaysia. We, we get questions from uh, requests from different places in the world to use our strains and evaluate them. And they, they uh, perform very well also in the linocellulose hydrolysis. But when you concentrate the hydrolysis, the hydrolysis more, to have more sugar, free sugar in the beginning, and to go to a higher ethanol level, you can see that the xylose fermentation again starts to slow down. The glucose fermentation goes on very well. 
Why is that? Because yeast has done glucose fermentation for more than a million years. It knows how to do glucose fermentation under all sorts of stressful conditions. But xylose fermentation is artificial. We humans put it in the strain. And when the conditions become stressful, the yeast does not know how to handle the xylose anymore. So this is something that we are improving. We, we are determining the mutations responsible for the xylose fermentation. We are introducing mutant alleles that improve acetic acid tolerance and tolerance to other inhibitors to have really super yeasts that can uh, do very good uh, fermentation in concentrated hydrolysis. So quite a number of people have uh, worked on these properties. This is our VIB uh, department. And I have to thank these people. These are all the companies that we have been dealing with, have supported our research, or have provided hydrolysis, or are doing evaluations. And I have to thank all these people, and I have to thank you for your attention. <laughs>